And we know that His Spirit is living in each of us. So there's a great accountability that comes when we do that. And that's why the Bible says, if somebody is going to defile that, you're defiling Yahweh, you're defiling His Spirit, you're defiling the only thing that really is life. Because we know that the wood in this building and the, the boards on the wall and everything else, the tables, they're all going to go. You're not going to be here for eternity. But the spirit that's in us will live for eternity. So that's why it says we are living stones being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh through Yeshua, Messiah. So like I said, there's a starting point. You don't walk into that room with short pants on. You don't walk into that room unmodestly dressed. You don't walk into that room. There's, there's an accountability to get into the room, first of all, physically. But then also, there's a greater spiritual accountability, as we read in Isaiah 1. Because we can come in physically now, with all the right look and all the right garb, but if our heart is not right before Yahweh, it's not going to be acceptable. He's going to say, he's going to say, I hate it. And that's what Israel was doing. They were doing the sacrifices to the letter. They were bringing the ritualistic way, but there was no change of heart. They weren't seeing that this was an avenue to lead somewhere else. In the same way that Yahweh has given us a ritual, remember I said last week, he told Moses, he didn't just say, go build the thing. And then because your heart is right, I'll come and dwell there. He said, no, you build it exactly like I'm telling you. Because this is a pattern from the heavenly. There has to be judicial order. There has to be physical structure. But then he says also, if the spiritual isn't there, if your heart isn't right, then all it is is going from one religion to another religion. So let's go to Deuteronomy 10. Because what does Yahweh, Yahweh require of us? What does he require of us when we come together? Because like I said, it is such a, it is a blessing. And that's why when I see, like I said, many brethren don't have congregations. They don't have brethren here. I have people write me all the time, I'll travel 500 miles if you have a congregation. Because they want to be near other brethren. And then there's brethren that have people 10 minutes away. And they don't want to travel. They don't want to travel. You know? And do we realize what we're losing... When as pillars of in the lively stones of this temple, we don't come together, each with our gifts, to build the house of Yahweh every Shabbat and allow His Shekinah to come down on us. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 11. And Yahweh said to me, Rise up, go before the people, causing them to set forward, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Exactly what we're here now. We're here at the end. We're here where... Judah has been restored back to the land. Ephraim is getting ready to be restored. And Yahweh is saying, I've got to prepare you guys. You've got to get ready. Because when Judah came, it was the physical. The physical comes before the spiritual. But when Ephraim comes, it will be the return of Messiah and the spiritual will come. So now there's got to be a greater accountability to it. And what does he ask that we need to do to be part of this? And now, verse 12, Israel, what has Yahweh your only asked of you? except to fear Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, and to serve Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of Yahweh and His statutes with I'm commanding you today for your good. We drop down to verse 16. And you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and you shall not harden your neck anymore. Drop down to verse 20. You shall fear Yahweh your Elohim, you shall serve Him, and you shall cleave to Him. And you shall swear by his name. Many people will say his name ain't even important. Where is our holiness? Where is our sanctity? Where is our mindset? Verse 21. He shall be your praise, and he shall be your Elohim, who has done for you these great and fearful things which your eyes have seen. He will be your praise. Do we love Yahweh? Are we seeking him with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength? Is he our praise? You know, I always say this. Of course, everybody likes a pat on the back sometimes. It's nice when people tell you you're doing something good. But it's not necessary. Because everything we do, we're doing for one reason. We're doing to serve Yahweh. And he is our praise. And that's the glory we get when we serve someone. Whether you're helping a poor person in the street, or you're helping an orphan or a widow, or anywhere. You're serving in the congregation. The whole point is the praise we get, the goodness we feel, is because we're glorifying Yahweh. 
Not because people are patting us on the back saying how good you are. Because as you go through life, you realize the same person patting you today is putting a knife in your back tomorrow. And like Yeshua said, you know, when they, when they came, and he said he knew the spirit that was in man. And if you live long enough, you will know the spirit that's in man, and it's an evil spirit. Our human nature is not a good spirit. So like I said, although it's fine, nothing wrong with it, I think we should, as the people of Yahweh, and I teach this in leadership, we should uh, enhance people that are helping, people that are part of a team. You, want, you don't want people to get discouraged. But at the same rate, for true people of Yahweh, it's not necessary. Because all we're trying to do, we want to serve Yahweh with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Because that is our praise. He is our praise. And we know that Yahweh sees everything. Love Yahweh with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. John 4 and verse 24. It says, Elohim is spirit, and the ones worshiping him must worship in spirit and truth. Because you always say, he, he knows my heart. You know, you'll meet people, and you'll tell them Yahweh's real name, and they'll still, God, 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 God. And then you'll say, but his name isn't God. His name is Yahweh. Well, he knows my heart. But that's the problem. Your heart is deceitful of all things, and incurable is in the original. Some say desperately wicked. You put it either way. They mean the same thing, Jeremiah 17, 9. But yes, he knows your heart, and he knows it is evil. He knows our human nature is evil to the core. And in times past, Yahweh winked at our ignorances, but now he causes men everywhere to repent, because Yahweh is spirit. And those that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In olden days, they didn't have Yahweh's spirit the way we do today. We do see in the first covenant, we see certain people that had the spirit of Yahweh. David had the spirit of Yahweh. Uh, certain others of the prophets, Samuel, had the spirit of Yahweh. And we'll see at times, the spirit of Yahweh came upon someone like Samson. He didn't have the spirit of Yahweh, but it came upon him. And then he did something. But today, we have literally the spirit of Yahweh not just guiding us. We have it living in us. We are literal children. He has begot us. The same way a mother and a father come together and have a child. You know, that Yahweh has begotten us through his, his spirit. And we are literally embryos of him for his kingdom. So there's a greater accountability. And that accountability is we have to worship him in spirit and truth. You know, we can't just bring falsehood and lies because it's not acceptable to them. So if Yahweh is giving us everything we need to be holy, then why aren't we? Why aren't we? And I hate to have to say it, but I travel all over the world, and unfortunately, in the times we're living in, people are not seeking holiness overall. And we know it. We just read it in Isaiah 1. It's always a remnant, a remnant, a remnant. You know, what is a remnant? We know it could be as little as two. Joshua and Caleb were only two people out of some... Hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I don't like that number. <laughs> that really scares me. Like I said, my, my mind works in math. Odd law of odds and probability. I don't like 50%, but I'll take it because it's one out of two. I certainly don't like two people out of two million. My, my chances of that is, 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 is really scary. But anyway, you look at a remnant, it can be up to 10% sometimes. A remnant, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. And I'm going to talk some today. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to give another message uh, that I gave several years back, and I'm going to update it. It was called God of This World, to really show where this world is going to. And just from maybe about seven or eight years ago, when I gave that message, I cannot believe how fast things are going in the wrong direction in the world. And it's really scary to see it. But he's called us out of that world. And one of the reasons that we're not... Uh, even though he gives us everything to be holy, that we're not being holy is we're not seeking him in all things. We're not striving to love him with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And like I said last week, there's a spirit of compromise that's out there. You know, when you look at Isaiah 1, it was talking about the diluted wine. What does that mean? It's diluted. It means there's a compromise. That it took something that was pure and it was mixed. And whenever you mix something pure with something that's not pure, now, it's not that it's half pure, it's defiled. It's very simple. You know, Haggai. Remember Haggai. If you take holy porridge in your skirt and you touch the unclean, does it make the unclean clean? No. But if you take holy porridge in your skirt and you touch the unclean, does it defile the clean? Yes. So you can take a 
20-year Brunello bottle of wine, and if you dilute it with water, it's not that now it's half good, you've just destroyed it. The same with oil, you know, take, take good, good olive oil and mix it half with olive oil and half with water. What are you left with? Nothing. You know, you're left with nothing. So we don't want to dilute the spirit of Yahweh by compromising with the world. Because all we do when we do that is to follow ourselves. Many of the brethren are compromising with the world, and we will never get the mind of Messiah with one foot in and one foot out. It's that simple. The world affects the way you think and the decisions you make. And that's really what I want to focus on today, what's in here. Because as a man thinks, so he is. I'm going to mention that many times in the next hour or so. Proverbs 14, 14 says, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, but a good man away from himself. It's a really, really neat proverb. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, but a good man away from himself. See, somebody who is striving to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be the person Yahweh wants to be, they know their human nature is evil, and they're trying to strive away from themselves. But yet the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. The backslider makes excuses why everything he's doing is correct, it's always somebody else. It's my husband, my wife, my teacher, my friend, my neighbor, you know, all the way up to Yahweh. The plumber, whoever is around at the time, the backslider is always making excuses because he's not changing. Because he's comfortable with the world, he's comfortable with the way the world is, and he doesn't want to change. And that's the scary part, I've said this many times, that when you go too much into the world, you know, like you are what you eat, you become it. And then all of a sudden, you're it. You become that way. You become so defiled that you're part of it. And then it doesn't affect you anymore. You know, the parable of the sower and the seed, the, the, the seed that's on the, the stony ground, these people that they come and they hear and they're excited and they can't get enough and they're listening to the messages, but they don't separate from the world. So what happens? It gets further and further away until they're right back there again. And then there's excuses why their Sunday church actually isn't so bad, but Christmas really all they know it's not good. Okay, they took the Christmas tree away, but they're going to do it this way. And that spirit of compromise brings torture. And if you look, one of the highest rates of suicide in the world are people who come to the truth and leave it, believe it or not. Because once you come to the truth, where else do you go? It's all downhill from there. You know, and really more than downhill. It's a one-way ticket to the lake of fire. And people really that know the right way and don't follow through with it, they torture themselves. You wind up torturing yourself. So again, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man away from himself. The person who's trying to follow holiness, he knows his ways are not right. He knows what his human nature is, and he's striving every day of his life to change. And that's why I say, we talked about it last week, the clothes you wear, the friends you have, the programs you watch, the sites you click, the music you listen to, are they drawing you closer to Yahweh or to the world? You know, like I said, the backslider is going to make every excuse in the world why it's okay. But just ask that one simple question. Is this whatever drawing me closer to Yahweh or closer to the world? Because it's your choice. We all have free choice. But that choice will affect how your mind is going to think and what you're going to do and ultimately where you will be at the end of eternity. Are you grieved by the wicked world of Satan or are you entertained by it? Must separate to have any chance to make the kingdom. So again, I always, to a degree, understood we're talked about in the end time, separation from the world and the mark of the beast, but not really until we're hitting the times, and we haven't even hit the worst times yet. But at least where we are now, and you see that gulf, you know, like in Luke 16, Lazarus and the rich man, you see that gulf getting bigger and bigger, and it might have went from a little pond into uh, a river, into a lake, and now it's into an ocean. We can see why in the end time, it's either total separation or lose out on the kingdom. It can't be in between, because the world has changed that much, and it becomes that much Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinks, so he is. Or, as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So really, your thoughts 
represent who you are, what you will do, and what you will become. As a man thinks, so he is. Your thoughts represent who you are, and what you will do, and what you will become. And that's why I believe meditation is such an important tool of Yahweh. Because reading is great, we have to read the Word. You know, praying, you know, you can't survive without prayer, you need contact with Yahweh. Of course, fasting, fasting is a great tool that comes in, we'll talk a little more of that in a little bit. But meditation, you need time to, to analyze it. You need time, quiet time, to let Yahweh share with you what it means. You know, what good is all the information in the world if none of it is analyzed? You become just like a computer. You know, you're just storing information, but you're not really applying it. So you need time. You need time for Yahweh to be able to talk to you. And like we know with the prophet Eliyahu, you know, when he ran away to Mount Horeb and came before Yahweh, which I believe Yeshua was there, and the first thing they said is, what are you doing here? <laughs> He's in the middle of his job that he abdicated. But then Yahweh said it again the second time, what are you doing here? And he didn't hear Yahweh in the wind, he didn't hear him in the hurricane, he didn't hear him in the fire. It was that small, still voice. Meditation. There's time you need by yourself, going out and just hearing Yahweh on your own. Are your thoughts on Yahweh's kingdom continually, or on yourself and worldliness? And it's a tough world, no doubt about it. The daily cares of life, we're warned about it, what Yeshua says, and if they were a warning 2,000 years ago, how much more now? So I think Yahweh understands that. It's a more complicated world than probably ever before. But still, we don't want to get our focus off. And that's why as a man thinks, so he is. What are your thoughts? Is it on the kingdom of Yahweh or on yourself and worldliness? How much time do you pray every day and what are you praying for? Are you praying about the kingdom? Are you praying about stop suffering of the poor? And the widow and the orphan, we just read in, in uh, Isaiah 1. One of the things that Yahweh says, he's against the people because they're not caring for the poor. You know? Well, we callous to it because we see it so much. You know, we've, for years and years and years, you see the people dying in Africa and this and that. And has it become part of just norm normality to us? So what are our prayers for? Uh, Yahweh's kingdom, stopping suffering of poor widow orphan. Are we praying for Yahweh's leaders? And his work around the world, bringing the good news to all those. Do we pray for those that we see killed in war? We have many wars going on today. Do we cry and sigh daily for Yahweh to bring his kingdom now? How fed up with are we with this world? Literally remember in Ezekiel the ninth chapter, the ones that are sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the earth. Are we doing that and praying for Yahweh to bring his kingdom? Or are our prayers simply for ourselves? Give me this, give me that. As a man thinks, so he is. And your prayers, when you're talking, like I said, the sanctuary of Yahweh, the holiness, the sanctity, we come together, you get on your hands and knees, you know, you go in that prayer closet and you put your head down and you're literally entering into heaven. The angels are opening up that gate and you have access to the only true Elohim of the universe. And when you get that access, and it's like, I dad, one of your kids in here, oh, okay. Put everything down. You got this uh, hurricane going on there? Hold the hurricane off. You know, this storm over here, hold it off here. Tell Philo Doc, uh, wait a few minutes. My, my, my son is here. My daughter's here. Bring him in. And you're before his throne. What do you say? Give me this. Give me that. I can't pay the rent. I can't do this. I'm sick. I'm out this. Or are, you, or are your thoughts his thoughts? Are you praying? Father, bring your kingdom. You know, like he says, is this in heaven? Let it be on earth. Do we get into detail on that? Do we pray for each specific part of the world? All the different countries where his work are going. There's different things. There's different problems in South America than there are in Africa. Different problems in Asia. Are we praying fervently for Yahweh's kingdom? Is it, or are our prayers all centered around ourselves? As a man thinks, so he is. Of course, it's people, not just men. Matthew 12 verse 33 it says either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt for the tree is known by its fruit I love that scripture because it's pretty plain 
Truth is truth, lies are lies, and Yahweh knows the top from the bottom. You know, make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. Generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And the evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every vain word, whatever men may speak, they will give an account of it on judgment day. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned, as a man thinks. So he is. Your words are simply the outward manifestation of what's in your heart. That's the thing. Sometimes people have more patience than others. So they have all these evil thoughts, and they just don't say them. So somebody can be sitting there with a smile on their face. But what's going on in here? But after a while, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are our thoughts? What are our thoughts? What are our words? Your words are simply the outward manifestation of what's in your heart. Psalm 12. Great psalm. A psalm of David. Help, O Yahweh, for the righteous ceases to be, for the faithful fail from among the sons of men. They speak vanity, each man with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. You see it today in the churches all over the world. Right? They come to church, all goaded up, one that looks nicer than the other, and then they come with this false smile, and they say hello, and then the minute they leave, they're backstabbing, talking against each other. Gossip, vanity. They speak vanity, each man with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Yahweh shall cut off all with flattering lips and the tongue that speaks great things. Who say, we shall be strong by our tongue, our lips are our own. Who is master over us? See it all the way to, hey, I'll never follow a man, I'll never do this, I'll never do that. The bolster is the proud. They're strong with their lips. Their lips are their own. Who's going to lord over us? For the pain of the poor... For the sign of the needy, I will now rise up, says Yahweh. I will set in safety he who pants for it. Like I said, are we grieved? I thought this years ago, because I've had a great life. I haven't had a life of poverty and poor and all that other stuff. But years ago when I realized what's really going on in the world, I said, how on earth can I be happy for my life when so many millions of people are suffering and don't have basic food, water? You know? So my prayers just can't be, thank you, Yahweh, for making my life good when all these other people are suffering. And every time we see Yahweh intervening, who's he intervening for? The underdog. He's intervening for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the ones who can't contend for themselves. For the pain of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. I will now rise up, says Yahweh. I will set in safety. He pants for it. The words of Yahweh are pure words, like silver refined in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. We just saw the example of the dross, the leftover, the nothing of the silver coming out that he's saying. But here, his words, the words of Yahweh are pure words. Like silver refined in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. Or are our words pure? Or everything we say with a pure heart? You shall keep them, O Yahweh. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk around on every side when evil is exalted by the sons of men. You know, just like Ecclesiastes, you know, when, when sentence is not brought speedily against an evil act, it's in the hearts of the sons of men continually to do evil. And that's what you have today. Evil goes rampant. If you try to do something righteous, you'll get hit for it. Like he says, the wicked walk around on every side. When evil is exalted by the sons of men. And the sons of men are exalting every kind of evil you can imagine. And that's why Yahweh says, come out of her, my people. Don't partake in it. You know, seek after true righteousness. Do your words give life or destroy it? Like I said, we are the people of Yahweh. We have His Spirit. And I know one of the greatest joys I get in my life, I have the blessing that I get a, uh, the opportunity to counsel with many people throughout the year all over the world. Half the time when people come with problems, there are things I could have never imagined in a million years. And half the time, I have no idea what to say. So what do you do? You pray to the Holy Spirit, and you, 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 you're asking and put words in my mouth. And there's no greater joy than when Yahweh's Spirit can let words come out of your mouth that give life to somebody. That somebody who's distraught 
Maybe they're sick. Maybe someone died. Maybe they lost their job. And they're really distraught. And something that Yahweh's Spirit speaks through your mouth can give comfort to someone. How much better is that than cutting down, than gossiping, than talking against? Because what are you doing then? Then you're becoming the servant of Satan, not the servant of Yahweh. You know, as a man thinks, so he is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Are our words giving life, or are they destroying life? You know, Yahweh is the ministry of reconciliation. We're here to bring life. Yeshua said, I didn't come to destroy, but to give life more abundantly. And that's what we want to do. We want to encourage, we want to exalt because the Holy Spirit can work through you. And like I said in the beginning, why isn't it working through so many? Because of compromise, because people are not submitting to Yahweh. You know, last week we got into the physical, today we're getting into the mental, next week we'll get into the spiritual. But you have to take it in steps. There's a judicial order to it. Everything has got to be in unison if we want Yahweh to enter into our life. And we want to make sure, like I said, that our mind, as a man thinks, so he is. That our thoughts are on Yahweh's purity. The words of Yahweh are pure like silver refined in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not count myself to have reached the goal. But one thing I do, forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things before, I press toward the goal to receive the prize of victory of the highest calling of Elohim and Messiah Yeshua. One thing I do, forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things before. See, we all came from somewhere. Even the Apostle Paul came from somewhere, not a good place. you know. But that's not the point where we came from. The point is where we're going to. And like scripture says, and we'll read it in a minute, we should not even speak about the evil things that these people do. Or the evil things that we did. And sometimes, you know, we're proud of it. Oh, I used to do this before I was called. I used to do this. And it should be a shame to us. We should be ashamed of the former person. It doesn't mean if a situation comes up. Sometimes we go through things as an unbeliever that when somebody is coming into the faith, we can share something with them. And that's why we go through horrors in life sometimes. Because we could say to someone, look, I went through this. You know, hey, I used to be like that. This is how I overcame. Not bragging about the sins we did, but showing maybe the avenue that Yahweh gave us to overcome. But we have to make sure we're doing this. Putting, forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things before. Pressing toward the goal to receive the prize of victory and the calling of Elohim and Messiah Yeshua. Verse 15. That as many as are perfect, think about these things. And if you think anything differently, Elohim will also reveal this to you. Yet as to where we have arrived, walk by the same rule, being of the same mind. Be fellow imitators of me, brothers, and consider those walking this way, even as you have us for a pattern. So that's the thing. When new people come in, I know when I was a new believer, I knew where I came from and I didn't want no part of it. And I wanted to look for people in the congregation that were leaders, that were more mature than me, that were living righteous, and I wanted to emulate them. Today it's the opposite. I mean, you don't know how many times people will write me for the very first time and say, I'm just coming to faith, but I'm going to tell you where you're wrong. <laughs> they have the answers. You know, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a minister for almost 20 years. You're 32 years in the walk. You've studied these things from people who studied, who studied, who studied, and you learn this. People sometimes, they're brand new, a couple of months, and, and all of a sudden they're going to tell you where you're wrong. And that's part of the age we live in, the Laodicean era, ruled by the people. The internet era, because people don't have to come to leaders anymore, you know, for, for doctrine. They can go on the internet and get it from whoever. But the thing you can't get from the internet is emulation. The internet can give you a, a paper, you have no idea who wrote the paper or whatever. But if you really, the way that, that you look in the Bible, the way that it's always been from the beginning of time, whether it was Moses through Joshua, going to Yeshua through the Twelve, to John through Polycarp, it was mentoring. It was always mentoring. And mentoring takes time. It means you spend time with somebody. You teach them. They see how you do things. So it's not just the words. It's the actions. 
It's, 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 it's how somebody's doing it. It's learning from life. The way we're supposed to from our parents, from our grandparents. And we've lost that in the kind of world we're living in. We lost the emulation of that. But we want to make sure that we're following that. We want to make sure we're emulating people in the faith. For many, verse 18, for many walk as enemies to the torture's sake of Messiah, whom I told you before, and now even weeping, I say, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and who glory in their shame, the ones thinking on earthly things. And unfortunately, a lot of times when somebody will come up to me with a paper or a doctrine or whatever, before I even get into that paper or doctrine, I want to see who the person is. Because if they have a bad spirit, if they're living unholy lives, if they're aggressive, if they're prideful, to be honest, I don't even want to read it. Because Yahweh yeah, doesn't work in those kind of people. And that's what he says here. Some people who are enemies for the torture stake of Messiah, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who walk in their shame, the ones thinking on earthly things. As a man thinks, so he is. Nothing wrong with good food, right? But is that where our thoughts are day and night? You know? Where is our thoughts? Is it on the kingdom of Yahweh? Or is it on the things of the world? Mark 7, and verse 18. And he said to them, are you also so undiscerning? Do you not perceive that all that enters from the outside into the man is not able to defile it? Could get you sick. You know, if you ate maybe some chicken yesterday and it was a little uncooked, you know, or maybe it fell on the dirt or whatever, and you ate it, you could get sick possibly from it or if it wasn't clean. But it's not going to spiritually defile you. You know, could, could physically hurt your stomach, but it's not going to spiritually defile you. Do not perceive that all that enters outside into the man is not able to follow. This is because it does not enter into the heart, but into the belly, and goes out into the wasteful, purging the food. And he said, that passing out of the man, it is that thing that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, cast out evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Remember, hatred is murder. Thefts, greedy desires, iniquities, Deceit, lustful desires, a wicked eye, blasphemy, pride, recklessness. All these things pass out from within and defile the man. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinks, so he is. How important is it to get control of our mind? And that's the point. If you're in the world and you're being bombarded daily with all these things of the world, that's what's going to go into your mind and that's what's going to come out of your mouth. And that's what your hands are going to do. And that's why sanctification, like we said, that yes, we physically want to look the part, but we also want to mentally think the part. And we are a sanctuary of Yahweh's spirit, that the almighty creator of the universe has chosen you out of maybe five million people to put his spirit in you and dwell among you and walk among you. And he says, I am set apart holy, you be set apart. And it's scary to me. That's one of the reasons why, as a, as a person, I never did drugs, you know. I grew up in the age where just about every one of the friends of mine from school did some kind of drug. Everything from marijuana to who knows what. I never did it. Never tried it. Because I never wanted to be in a situation where I didn't have control over my mind. I didn't want to be in that situation, you know. And it's the same here. You're talking about spiritual heroin. You're talking about giving your mind over to the world where you will not have control over it anymore. Yahweh is the light switch that you turn on and off. Holiness is something you strive for. To be in a relationship with Him, you strive for. And once you have that relationship, you protect it with every ounce of your being. Because once you give your mind willingly over to Satan, you'll never get it back. I'm telling you, I'm dealing now with a couple of people that are going through some problems with demons. Some of it demon possession and... There's some people I know that have had these problems for almost 30 years. And some are some really bad people. Some are friends of mine. But how? How could you have the spirit of Yahweh and be tortured by a demon for 30 years? To the point where sometimes they want to kill themselves. The demons are putting thoughts in their mind and this and that. It's because they haven't sanctified themselves. 
It is impossible, if you are sanctifying yourself by the Spirit of Yahweh, that a demon can bother you for 30 years. It is impossible. What does it say? Resist the devil, submit to Yahweh, and he will flee from you. And if you're going through problems like this for 10, 20, and 30 years, there's something wrong there. You ain't submitting to Yahweh, and you certainly ain't coming out of the world. You're giving that demon an in. And like I said, after a while, that you invite a spirit over and over and over into your mind, it doesn't matter whether it's through a song, whether it's through a video, whether it's through anything, you keep inviting that demon in, there's a point where he will live there, he will dwell in you. And all of a sudden, you don't care anymore. I've had people that have left the faith that were very good friends of mine that I couldn't believe after they left. Couldn't believe their mouth, couldn't believe the things they said. They were totally violated and back to the world. And you just don't care anymore. You know, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Why? Because Esau defiled the spirit of Yahweh. Esau defiled his birthright. Esau didn't care about the spirit of Yahweh dwelling in him and being the firstborn. Now what did he do it for? You know, just like we said here, with the belly, he did it for one morsel of food. He did it because he had no self-control. He did it because I'm hungry, and I don't care about nothing. Give it to me now. Going toward the flesh. Going toward the flesh. Our human nature is evil. Yahweh gives us a new spirit, but we must renew our heart and our mind daily. It's not just a one-time thing. We have to renew our heart and renew our mind daily. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and a man thinks so he is. And unfortunately, you know, I hate to have to say this, but it's true. I'm 32 years in this walk. There's never a point in your life until you die or the change comes that you can say, okay, I have 100% the mind of Yahweh. I don't have to work on it anymore. It doesn't work that day. It does get easier every day. It gets easier every day, you get more of the mind of Yahweh, but you will always, as long as we're living in this world, you will have to fight the world. And Satan will never stop trying to get in, but that's why you put fences around your world. And then he can't bother you. But when you're part of the world, when you're compromising, you're giving him an in. You're giving him an in into your life. Isaiah 58, we went over this a little bit in the Torah study. I'm going to go over the rest of it. When we're talking about the sanctuary of Yahweh, we're, we're talking about coming and setting ourselves before Him. I think it's a great chapter. Call out with the throat. You know, almost like when you're saying it over and over, you're getting a sore throat. And that's what Yahweh's saying. Call out with the throat. Do not spare. Lift up your voice like the ram's horn. And declare to my people their rebellion and their sins to the house of Jacob. Yet they seek me by day and desire knowledge of my ways as a nation that has done right and not forsaking the judgment of their Elohim. They ask me about judgments of righteousness. They desire to draw near to their Elohim. They say, why have we fasted and you did not see? Why have we afflicted our soul and you did not acknowledge? And I think sometimes people have the wrong concept of, of, of fasting. You know, it's like we want an answer. Okay, let's all fast. You don't fast for answers. Yahweh isn't some kind of machine. It's not like, I'm going to fast Yahweh. You know what? I went hungry for 24 hours. Now give me my answer. It's not like that. You fast for one reason. You fast because you're trying to draw closer to Yahweh. And if you look in biblical times, the way you draw closer to Yahweh is through time. Like I said, getting your mind on His mind. And in biblical times, food took a lot of time. They didn't have microwave dinners back in, in Israelite time. So you didn't go in the freezer, pull out a dinner, stick it in the microwave, and then you eat. It took hours. It took all day to make your bread, to make your lentils, to make your effort. So when you're fasting, it really doesn't have anything to do about food, necessarily. It has to do about time. It has to do that. I'm not going to put this toward worldly things. I'm going to focus on Yahweh. That's why I say there's people, you're going to fast and you're going to go to work. What's the purpose? You're simply going hungry. Fasting is about time. It's about dedicating time to Yahweh to seek His will, to get closer to Him. And the time for fasting is dramatic times, most of the time. It's when things are so far off, we better fast because you want to get right on the right line. It's not to, it's not to demand things of Yahweh. It's not to tell Him, I'm fasting, give me this. And that's what's happening here. People were fasting with the wrong attitude. They weren't saying, oh, look, I went hungry, like the, the parable of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. I fast twice in a week. 
And what did God say? No, you didn't fast. You went hungry twice a week. That's all you did. You went hungry from food. Because it's got to be in the heart. It has to be simply that you're trying to draw closer to Him because you want His mind to speak to you. And that is the purpose of the fast. Behold, on the day of your fast you find pleasure, and you drive all your laborers hard. What is the purpose? Look, you fast for strife and for debate, and you strike with the fist of wickedness. Do not fast as today to sound your voice in the high place. You know, it's not about demanding. Is this the fast I choose, will choose? A day for man to afflict his soul? Is it simply to go hungry? To bow his head like a bulrush and he spreads sackcloth and ashes? Will you call to this as a fast in a day of delight to Yahweh? That's what they were doing. Putting on ashes on their face, looking sad. Everybody, look, I'm fasting. Is this not the fast I've chosen? To open bands of wickedness, to undo thongs of of the yoke, and to send out the oppressed ones free, even that you pull off every yoke? Is it not to break your bread to the hungry, that you should bring the wandering poor home? When will you see the naked and cover him, and you will not hide yourself from your flesh? Like we're saying, this is what Yahweh is looking for. He's looking for us to care for the oppressed. And if we can't physically go out and find people like this, then we should be praying for these people during our fast. That's what Yahweh is looking for. Then your light shall break as the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahweh will gather you. Like I said, it's not in your belly. It's in your mind. And fasting is simply to get other things away so you could focus on your mind to Yahweh. That's what he's looking for. Then you shall call, and Yahweh will answer. And you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you put the yoke away from you, the pointing of the finger and the speaking said, gossip. And if you let out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as the noonday. And Yahweh will always guide you and satisfy your soul in the places in the strong and make strong your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Verse 13. If you turn your foot away because of the Sabbath from doing what you please on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight to the holiness of Yahweh, glorify, like we said, the sanctuary of Yahweh. This is something that's set apart for Him. And shall glorify Him to the holiness of not doing your own ways from finding your own pleasure or speaking your own. I literally had people say, I don't see why I couldn't go to a ball game on the Sabbath. Yahweh wants me to enjoy myself. You know, you're seeking your own pleasure. That's not Yahweh's pleasure. You know, going out to do something like that on the Sabbath. Not finding your own pleasure or speaking your own words. Do we realize when the sun sets, the same way that I'm trying to set to you, when you walk in that door on Shabbat and we're coming as the sanctuary of Yahweh with His Spirit in us, and we're asking His presence. We're calling down the Shekinah, and we're saying, Yahweh, speak through us. Give to us this day. Glorify us so we can glorify You. It's the same way when the sun is setting. The sun is setting, and Yahweh is saying, You are my children, I am sanctifying you for these 24 hours. And you're not to seek your own pleasure, you're not to speak your own words. And our, 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 our words on Shabbat should be different. I mean, our words should always be glorifying Yahweh, glorifying Yeshua. But more particularly on Shabbat, it's a commandment. It's a commandment that we need to be watching what we're saying. And we need to make sure that our words are His words. Then you shall delight yourself in Yahweh, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the earth, and make you eat with the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. So well, here's the eternal inheritance that we get from doing this, from sanctifying, from setting this day apart. So you see, it's a package deal. Why is Yahweh saying over there, I hate your Sabbaths? Because the people are coming defiled, diluted wine, one foot in, one foot out. They're coming before him doing ritualistic things of animals and thinking this is pleasing to him. But there's no change of heart. There's no change of heart. And now he's putting his spirit in us, and he's saying, you can change. I'm giving you what you need to change, but you need to make the choice. 
You need to make the choice. You need to guard that spirit that's in you. Because as a man thinks, so he is. And in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Titus 1, 15 and 16. Truly all things are pure to the pure, but nothing is pure to those being defiled and faithless. But even their mind and their conscience has been defiled. They possess to know Yahweh, but by their works they deny Him, and they are abominable and disobedient, condemning every kind of good work. And unfortunately there's people like this, even in the body of Messiah, that no matter what is being done, they're going to find the negative part to it. No matter what somebody's done, they're going to say something negative. Condemning, condemning, condemning in every, every avenue. And like he says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and the disobedient, nothing is pure. Nothing is pure. You know, do we see the good in things or do we only see the evil? And are we making the right perception? Psalm 18, verse 23. Psalm 18 and verse 23. For I was upright with him and kept myself from my iniquity. And Yahweh has returned to me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands before his eyes. With the merciful, you reveal yourself as merciful. With the upright man, you reveal yourself as upright. With the pure, you reveal yourself as pure. And with the crooked, you appear perverse. For you will save an afflicted people, but you will bring down all the eyes. And like I said, the people that are self-serving, the people that are not sanctifying themselves before Yahweh, in the end of the day, even Yahweh is the evil one. False perception will bring false procedure. False perception will bring false procedure. You know, we're not to judge by appearance, but by righteous judgment. When we see something, do we find out if it's true or not before we start making assumptions? So like I said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, as a man thinks, so he is. And if we're constantly thinking things that may not be true without all the evidence, then we're defiling the sanctuary of Yahweh. False perception will bring false procedure. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. Because to the people of Yahweh, to the people that are really... Loving Yahweh with both their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. Even the things we go through in this earth, even the trials we go through, they see a positive side to it. Because we know our, our, our life is not in the parameters of these four walls or, or the few days we have in this life. That our life, there's a bigger picture to it. That we are part, we're, we're one link in a chain that started with Adam and will end with Yeshua's return. And we look at that as being a part of that link that doesn't want to be an open link, but we want to be a link that holds it together. And we want to make sure that this part of history, the same way we read about Adam's part of history that wasn't a good day, and then we read about King Saul's part of history that wasn't a good day, but we also read about Abraham's part of history that was a good day. We read about Moses' part of history that was a good day. And King David's, we want to be part of that. We want to be part of the good days of Yahweh. We want to be part of what is given to us, that we're holding it together and we're bringing it to the next one. We want to be something in history as it's being written. Remember, there's a book of life and it's opened up and everything we're doing is being written every day as it's going along. And as that book of life is going to be read someday in the heavenly courts, we want to pray that the things that are written about us are what? You know, like we always say when we start the school, our legacy. That it's something that will be remembered as righteous. That it's something that will be remembered as helping to bring the kingdom of Yahweh about. Because if there's nothing good in that book written about you, what happens? You go to the lake of fire. You know, we want to make sure we're not an empty page written in the book of life. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. In every way being troubled, but not overwhelmed. Being harassed on all sides, but not conquered. Being persecuted, but not being forsaken. Being thrown down, but not having been destroyed. For we always bear in our bodies about the death of our Master Yeshua, that also the life of Yeshua may be made manifest in our body. He went through sufferings, we go through sufferings. For we who live are always being delivered up to death on account of Yeshua, that also the life of Yeshua 
may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So the death indeed is close to us, and life is near to us. Drop down to verse 16. Because of this, we do not grow weary, but if indeed our outward man is being decayed, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So what may seem on the outside, you know, maybe there's trouble in the house, maybe there's stress uh, with paying rent, maybe you just got fired, maybe you got a sickness, whatever it is, that's, that, that's the fleshly man. But the inward man, the spiritual man, is being renewed day by day. And we can't let these physical trials that Yahweh allows us to go through for purification destroy us. Because of this, we do not grow weary, but if indeed our outward man is being decayed, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For while the troubles of the present time are little and light, a great and limitless glory forever and ever is prepared for us. We do not rejoice in the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things being seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are everlasting. And that faith that He's giving us through His Spirit, we need to be sharing it with others. Our only hope is in the kingdom. We don't trust in the wicked system of Satan. We completely sanctify ourselves from the system of Babylon. We focus on Yahweh. We pray without ceasing. We renew the Holy Spirit daily through the reading of His Word, through meditation, through prayer, and through fasting. So it's a daily grind. It's something we need to do every day of our life because has there ever been a day of your life you didn't have a thought? Do you ever wake up one day and your mind is just blank? And you can't even think, hey, my mind is blank because you can't think. You just walk around the clouds for a day. Of course not. You always have thoughts coming in. But as a man thinks, so he is. And as an abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be led astray. Bad communications ruin good habits. Everything around you is affecting you. Like we said, the music you listen to, the sites you're clicking on, the things you're watching, but more than anything, the people you're with. Bad communication, room, good habits. If our friends are in the world, then our friendship is with the world. If our friends are in the world, then our friendship is with the world. Is that simple? Doesn't mean we can't know people in the world, because that's our mission field. So we're not uh, running up to the hills, trying to be away. But our friendships... The people that we're close with should not be unconverted worldly people. Because if that's the case, if our friends are in the world, then our friendship is with the world. And it will take you away. More than anything, the people you're with and the people you will become by. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Paul is very clear on this. He says, so that he that thinks he can stand, let him be careful that he not fall. You know how many people I've had through the years say, well, I'm only doing this because I'm going to convert them. I've had young people that said that, oh, I'm going back to my friends because I'm going to convert them. What happened? They leave the congregation a short time. I've had people that are brand new, they won't leave their Sunday church because I'm going to witness to them. After about three months, they're back to the Sunday church. He who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. You know? Or do we think we're stronger than the devil? Do we think that we're wiser than he is? I don't. Because I know. I know the evilness. I know the spirit that he is. And that's why we pray to Yahweh's spirit, but we also don't tempt that spirit by putting temptation before us. No temptation is taking you except what is human. But Elohim is faithful who will not allow you to be tested above what you are able. But with the trial, he will also make the way out so that you may, may be able to bear it. you got to take that out, though. On account of this, keep away from idolatry, my beloved. I speak as the prudent ones. You judge what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a partaking of the blood of Messiah? The bread which we break, is it not a partaking of the body of Messiah? For just as the loaf of the bread is one, for we are all one body, for we all partake of that one bread. There's a great accountability. If you look at every true believer compared to every person in the world, like I said, it might be one in five million, and the number just keeps getting less and less. There is a great accountability to being a true believer of Yahweh. Look at Israel, whose observances is according to flesh. Are not those eating the sacrifices partakers of the altar? 
What then do I say? That an idol is anything or an idolater's sacrifice is anything? No. But the thing the pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to Yahweh. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Some of these people could be the nicest people in the world, but if they have freely chosen to go the way of Christianity, which is a pagan religion, and they don't want the truth, there comes a point you've got to shake the dust off your feet and move on. You cannot drink the cup of our master and a cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of our master and a table of demons. Or do we provoke our master to jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? I don't think so. So we want to make sure bad communications ruin good habits. Like I said, the world is our mission field. Doesn't mean we don't associate with. But the Bible talks about intimately associating with people, friendships. And the friendships should be with like-minded believers, or it will take you away. First Corinthians 5 and verse 11. He says, but now I wrote to you not to associate intimately. If anyone is called a brother, and is either immoral, or a covetous one, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortionist, would such, would such a one do not even break bread? For what business is it to me to judge the ones outside the congregation? But you may make judgments on those inside the congregation. But Yahweh will judge the ones outside, and you shall put away yourself those wicked persons. So this is talking about inside as well as outside. And I know I look at these scriptures, and I don't think that I'm too strong. I know my weaknesses, and that's why there's no greater joy I take than to be about people that are strong in Yahweh, people that are serious, because it's going to make me more serious. You don't want to be with people that are going to pull you away and tear you down. If our friends are in the world, then our friendships are of the world. 1 Kings 18, 21. I don't have to go there. I'll read it. It's talking with Eliyahu. When he came before the people, when he fought the priests of Baal, and he said, until when are you limping over to opinions? If Yahweh is Elohim, follow him. If Baal is Elohim, follow him. But the people did not answer a word. When are you going to stop dividing over to opinions? And that's why I was saying last week, and I continue to say here, that it is the spirit of compromise that is the greatest danger to believers today. People thinking they're strong enough, thinking they're wise enough, that they can compromise with the ways of Yahweh and it's not going to affect them. But like I said, in the end of the day, when you see, unless Yahweh left a remnant, we would be a sign of the war. We've got to take these things serious. Must stop dividing between two opinions. To Yahweh, it's hypocrisy. And the kingdom is coming. You know, the kingdom is closer, like it says, much closer today than when we first started believing and I can tell you, we are not ready for it. We're not ready for it. And that should be the thing to motivate us more than anything. Ephesians 5, verse 3. But let not fornication and all uncleanness or greediness be named among you as is fitting for saints. Also, cursing and foolish talking, or witty insults, none of which are necessary, but rather the giving of thanks. Like I said, not only on Shabbat, but all the time when we get together. We should be singing praises, glorifying Yahweh, uplifting each other, not making silly, witty insults, which many times the world does, but rather the giving of thanks. For you should know this, that anyone guilty of fornication, or an unclean person, or a covetous one, who is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and no need. Somebody who has a covetous spirit is called an idolater. You know, and we want to make sure, like I said, many of us here are from Babylon, and that can be a strength to have people with us, but it can also be a great weakness, weakness. Because we become comfortable with who we are, and we're all part of the same mold. And idolatry, covetedness, which is idolatry, is a big sin of Babylon. We want to make sure that we're not bringing this sin into our life and we're overcoming it. One of the ways I didn't even know what covetedness was until I started traveling to third world places. And then you start to see, and that's why I love in Richard Wormbrandt, uh, that book that he has, on am in the underground congregation, when he says he went into a supermarket and he started going up and down the aisles and he said, wow, this is really good. 
but I can do without that. Wow, this would really taste good, but you know, I can do without that. And he said he went through that whole supermarket knowing that he didn't buy anything. That even though everything that was there would have been good and maybe not wrong, he didn't need it. He didn't need it. And if we're constantly buying and buying and covetedness with things that we don't need, where's our mind? As a man thinks so, yes. We want our focus to be on Yahweh, on glorifying Him, on praising Him. You know, wherever your mind is, that's where we're going to become. Let no one deceive you, verse 6, with empty words. For through these things the wrath of Yahweh comes on the sons of disobedience. This is why Yahweh's wrath is coming, because of the way the world is. Then do not become partakers with them. For you then were in darkness, but you are now in the light of the Master. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And you must discern what is acceptable. How can you discern if you have one foot in the world and one foot out? You discern by the Spirit of Yahweh. You discern by His Word. That's the way you discern, and that's why you've got to come out of the world so you know right from wrong. But what do you do? We'll be just like all those people out there. As you're telling them about the Torah, they have a reason why it's not important. Because their righteousness is not coming from the word of Yahweh. It's coming from their mind and their heart, which is deceitful and incurable. As a man thinks, so he is. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather condemn them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things being done by them in secret. You know, we all know evolution has been being taught since the 1960s, even before that, but really big in the last 40, 50 years. But evolution is still going. If you look at evolution, or evolution as I like to call it, what is it? It is the evolving of man. It is quote unquote the new normal. And that's why I say the purpose of man is an extremely important topic. Because it shows that Yahweh has absolutes and that his righteousness is absolute and he doesn't change. That there's not an evolving of the new norm. What's the new norm that just came out the last few months? Homosexuality. Get used to it. That's what they keep saying. It's the new norm. And you know what? Churches now, pastors, pastors in the last few months have said, uh, even though I thought this was wrong in the past, I love my country, I have this... What? Where will we be 10, 20, 30 years from now? Where will we be? We don't want to be part of the new norm. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful words of darkness, but rather condemn them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things being done by them in secret. Yahweh's word doesn't change. Yahweh is not part of evolution. First they took prayer out of the schools. Then women's rights, abortion, cohabitation, homosexuality, new age. This is all part of the new normal. And what does it go by? Society. We're going to do a poll. You know what? 56% of the people say homosexuality is okay. It's normal now. Huh? 56% of the people say it's okay to live together without marriage. It's normal. Well, I don't think. No, no, no. It's normal. They're saying it. The people are saying it. Lay out the saying. Ruled by the people. It's just like ancient Rome, the thumbs up or the thumbs down, homosexuality, up or down. What is going on here? What is going on? And as we're living through this transformation that, that is absolutely wicked, and literally people are getting fooled by it because they have one foot in and one foot out. There's a reason why Yahweh says, come out of them, my people, and don't partake with them. And now we're seeing, like I said, that Gulf is getting wider and wider and wider because it is so abominable. It is so abominable what they're doing. Killing, infanticide, innocent, unborn children, and they'll come in your face and they'll beat you with a bat because they want the right to choose. And they are choosing. I put before you life and death. Choose life. They ain't choosing life. The world has chosen death and they're sticking their fist to Yahweh. And saying, you know what? You don't exist. And you think he exists? Take your, your Yahweh, get out of here. And they're becoming violent. I've seen it even in the last few weeks. Big homosexual rally. One guy comes just with a little sign over there. And they're coming in his face and shoving him. Get him on the ground, kick him, punch him. Hey, what happened to tolerance? Right? Isn't that one of the catchwords? Tolerance. No tolerance for me if I don't accept it. Now I'm a hate monger. 
Now I'm, I'm, I'm going against your human rights. This is the new world. This is the new norm. I don't want any part of it. It's not Yahweh's norm. It certainly ain't my norm. I am Yahweh. I change not. And things that were abomination to him in the Garden of Eden are abomination today. And we can't be part of the new norm. We can't. Because it is not Yahweh's norm. And I'm telling you, if it wasn't so serious, if it wasn't so much life and death, but this thing is going worldwide, and it's going fast. And it's really to the point that the people of Yahweh have to make this decision. Verse 13, But all things being condemned are exposed by the light and are clearly revealed, for everything having been revealed is light. Because of this, he says, Arise, sleeping ones, and arise from the dead ones, and Messiah will give you light. Then watch how carefully you walk, not as unwise, but as wise ones, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Time is short, and every day, not just redeeming it in our life, but because there's people out there that are right on that fence, and it's eternal life and eternal death, and Yahweh has given us opportunity to touch them. He's given us opportunity to put our hand out and pull them back. And praise Yahweh. We had our meeting yesterday. In the last six months to a year, so many more hundreds and thousands of people are coming to the truth. They're hearing it. They want to know more. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. For this reason, do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of Elohim is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, renewing His Spirit every day. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and praising in your heart to Yahweh, giving thanks at all times for all things to Yahweh the Father in the name of our Master, Yeshua Messiah. That's the people of Yahweh. Praising and singing and joyfully coming together. What are our thoughts? Because what our thoughts are is what we will do and who we are. That scripture, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. But we are humble in your midst, even. Whoops, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already working. What an understatement. Until he who now is the obstacle is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be exposed, whom our Master Yeshua will consume by the spirit of his mouth and will destroy by the brightness of his coming. His coming is due to the working of Satan in all power and miraculous signs and lying wonders. And in all deceit of unrighteousness and those who will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And because of this, Yahweh will send to them a working of deception... For them to believe the lie. That those not believing in the truth, but who have delighted in unrighteousness, all may be damned. But we ought to thank Yahweh always concerning you, brothers, beloved by Yahweh, because Yahweh chose you from the beginning to salvation and sanctification of the Spirit and through a true faith. To which He called you through our preaching to be the glory of our Master Yeshua Messiah. So then, brothers, stand firm. And strongly hold the commandments you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. But may our Master Himself, Yeshua Messiah, and our Elohim and Father, the one having loved us and having given everlasting comfort and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and may He establish you in every good word and work. May He establish you in every good word and work. As a man thinks, so he is, and under the abundance of the heart, the mouth. Speaks. Time to choose. It's not just going to happen. Yahweh gives us free will. We have to every day choose to allow His Spirit to renew our mind. To choose to come out of the world and serve Yahweh. The physical look is the outward expression of your mind. And your words are the outward expression of your heart. We must strive every day to fight the flesh and let the Holy Spirit direct our lives. Stop listening to the impulses of the flesh with anger, jealousy, gossip, lust, and self-will, and submit to Yahweh in all things. We cannot compromise it all as a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Next time we will discuss the spirit, how to surrender to it, and how to allow it to change us into the very nature of Yahweh. So Yahweh bless. Until next time. Shabbat Shalom.